Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I've just remembered how much more nerve-wracking it is than talking to students, talking to, to you guys. Um, so if I've got the shakes, that's why. Um, so yeah, my name's Angela Bithell. I'm a lecturer in stem cell biology and regenerative medicine at the University of Reading. Uh, oh, apologies. I tend to walk. Um, I'll try and keep still. Um, uh, at the, so I'm at the University of Reading, based in the School of Pharmacy there. I'm also a member of the Oxford Alzheimer's Research UK network. And it's fantastic for me to have the opportunity today to try to tell you why stem cells are such a great thing for trying to understand dementia. Not only understanding dementia, but hopefully in terms of trying to find new treatments for dementia. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. First, I have a bit of a confession to make. So... In, in terms of most of my research, I'm not a dementia-specific researcher. Most of my background is really in understanding normal brain development. And in particular, how do we go from these guys, my favorite stem cells, neural stem cells, to one of those things, which is an, an adult brain, not, not to scale, I hasten to add. Um, so these are my, this is my main background. So how do neural stem cells generate the huge, vast complexity of cells and connections that are in the adult nervous system? And we've already talked about nerve cells, so your brain contains the nerve cells. These are the cells that communicate and allow you to, to, to perform all the tasks and functions that you do. But there are a bunch of other cells as well that we shouldn't neglect. In fact, I, I'm, I'm, uh, all of my research is concerning these support cells, um, which are called astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. And collectively, these cells make up your adult brain. So how do we go from neural stem cells into those? That's an important thing. You think, well, what's this got to do with dementia? OK. One thing you might be thinking, well, I've heard about stem cell transplantation. And in fact, part of the research that I am interested in, thank you, part of the research that I am interested in is um, perhaps how we can help the brain to repair itself. So by understanding normal brain development, so how the brain normally generates, we can apply that knowledge to try and to repair the brain. I'm, I'm really not going to talk about this today, but I just wanted to mention it. So of course, one way might be stem cell transplantation, but another one is also maybe we can find ways to help the brain to repair itself. So I, but I'm not really going to talk about that. But I thought that might be something that you're already familiar with. What I want to concentrate on today is using stem cells to understand dementia and find new drugs, not just to repair the brain. So why, do, why are stem cells so important for this kind of research? Well, first of all, human cells can be very difficult to get hold of, particularly brain cells. I'm pretty sure no one's willing to donate their brain cells whilst living for research. And so it's very difficult for us to sometimes get the tissue, the cells that we need in order to do the research. So often you get post-mortem brain samples, and that gives us some information, but that's the end of the disease. That's at the end stage. It doesn't allow us to look at what happens upstream, what causes the disease. It just says, this is how it is at the end. So stem cells allow us to do that. And then once we've got those stem cells and we can turn them into brain cells, we can try to understand how does the disease occur. Once we have that, we can perhaps think, well, what are the new targets, as Emma already has introduced for me? Find new targets, find new drug targets, and also use these cells to test those drugs on. And I'll hopefully explain that a little bit more. So, back to stem cells. One type of stem cell is called a pluripotent stem cell. It's a big word. All it means is it can make any cell type of the body. So these are particularly useful cells. So it, it has the cardinal properties of a stem cell is it can make loads more of itself. So once you've got one, you can get as many as you like. And you can turn it via a variety of methods into any cell type of the body. And an example of this is the embryonic stem cell. You've probably all heard about embryonic stem cells in the news, along with all the controversy that goes with them for human embryonic stem cells. But a pluripotent stem cell, such as an embryonic stem cell, can make any cell of the body. But for dementia research, of course, we're interested in brain cells. 
So what we can do is, once we have pluripotent stem cells, we can turn them into my favourite stem cell, which is a neural stem cell, which can also make lots more of itself. And we can turn it into any of the cells in our brain. Well, this is great. However, as you know, there have been ethical issues with uh, human embryonic stem cells, um, and also availability of those cells is pretty restricted. And up until 2007, this was the only way that we could get uh, pluripotent stem cells was from, uh, from embryonic stem cells, from um, em human embryos. However, really groundbreaking research in 2007 by a group led by someone called Shinya Yamanaka discovered a way of taking cells from us, from, from, for example, skin cells, quite commonly skin cells, hair cells, reprogramming those cells back to a pluripotent stem cell state. So, for instance, you could take a little sample of your skin, give it to the relevant scientists, we can reprogram them and end up with pluripotent stem cells. No need for embryos at all. And these are known as induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells, for short. And this has led to a huge, huge effort now in research, because why is this particularly important? Obviously, it makes it much easier for us to get human pluripotent stem cells, and of all the cells downstream of that. That's one thing. More importantly, we can make patient-specific stem cells. And even more important, we can make disease-specific stem cells. So Emma's already mentioned that some forms of disease, for example, some of the early onset Alzheimer's, they have a defect in a gene, a faulty gene, okay, a fault in their genetic code. If we take a skin sample from those patients and reprogram them into pluripotent stem cells, they take that person's genetic makeup. So those cells and every cell derived thereof has the same genetic defect. So now we can actually look at well, what does that defect, what effect does that defect have on those cells? So it gives us a huge potential as a, as a tool for understanding what causes a disease. So again, taking the example of Alzheimer's disease, I said you get these toxic protein buildup. One of those was amyloid. So a lot of those people that have early onset that's inherited of Alzheimer's disease, so they have a defect in a gene, have a defect in one of these genes, in, in this one, um, APP. All, all three of these, in fact, will lead to the toxic buildup of this amyloid protein and will give those people Alzheimer's disease. So now we can make stem cells and therefore brain cells that carry these mutations and they're human cells and we can look to see what happens in those cells before those cells die. So obviously we know those cells die and this is what happens and we start to get memory loss, etc. But what happens before? What causes it? So we can try to find new targets earlier on in the disease. So now we've got stem cells, we can of course make healthy stem cells and we can compare them to stem cells that carry a genetic defect. Or in fact, we can take them from what we call sporadic Alzheimer's patients, so those without a known mutation. But again, look for what's different between those cells. And what <clears throat> people in my group and also other colleagues I work with and many researchers around the world are doing is doing just this. We can turn these into different kinds of brain cells so the nerve cells and the support cells. Uh, in particular, one thing I'm interested in doing is growing these in 3D cultures. So if you remember my very first slide, I said brain in a dish. It's trying to build our equivalent of a brain in a dish to get these cells to make connections so they're talking to one another and we can actually measure the activity, what we call the network activity of these cells and the communication and look at what might be problems in these cells. I just wanted to show, hopefully the lights allow, it's actually a picture of some real-life human IPS-derived nerve cells. So the red is the little processes coming out of the nerve cell, and then blue is just showing you the nucleus of all of those cells where the DNA is held. And these are actually human, healthy human, uh, IPS-derived nerve cells. But we can also make the support cells, those other cells I told you about. So we now have our two types of, uh, of stem cells our little brain in a dish, if you like, from healthy people or from patients perhaps carrying a defect that leads to something like Alzheimer's disease. 
Equally, this is true, we can do this for Parkinson's disease, for Huntington's disease. And we can look for what are differences between those, between those cells, between those nerve cells. What happens, what's different in the, in the faulty gene nerve cells that might lead to them dying later in the brain? And not just what's wrong in those nerve cells, what also might be going on in those support cells? Because whilst they may not be the cells that ultimately die and lead to the, the sort of symptoms of dementia, they can contribute to the disease. So it also allows us to look at what's faulty, what's wrong with these cells early on in a disease process. The more we understand about the mechanism, what causes a disease, the more we can start to think about finding new drug targets. We understand better. If this particular protein is, is wrong, this particular pathway in the cell is wrong, can we find a drug to target and correct that particular problem? So what we're doing now, and so myself together with collaborators and researchers all over the world, is doing just this and generating these, if you like, in vitro models of disease using patient stem cells, and trying to find new drug targets. We can also use these cells in the dish to test drugs. It's a drug screen. We have a whole bunch of drugs. Let's try. We know that this is what's wrong with the cells. If we throw this drug on, does it correct that, that problem? And not only that, one other thing. So we talked to, I think, um, Richard mentioned about how sort of, if you like, awful the drug discovery is for such a, uh, dementia such as Alzheimer's disease. A lot of drugs fail in the pipeline and they fail in clinical trials, not just because they don't work, but sometimes just because they're actually toxic. They turn out to be toxic when they get into clinical trials in humans. And so we can also, uh, one of our other aims is to use these, these uh, stem cells in culture to test for toxicity of drugs as well as for efficacy against particular, for particular diseases. So really, just to summarise, what the, the main things I want you to take home about stem cells, we can now, due to this reprogramming technology that we've had since 2007, we can make human pluripotent stem cells by reprogramming of our, of our adult cells. So we no longer rely on embryonic, human embryonic stem cells and all of the restrictions and ethical uh, problems that go with those. We can now make patient-specific human pluripotent stem cells relatively easily in the laboratory. And as a stem cell, it can be expanded, we can grow many, many of these cells, and we can turn them into any cell we like. And of course, here we're particularly interested in Alzheimer's and in dementias. It's also true for any other disease, neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, and in fact, any other disease. If you remember, we can turn pluripotent cells into any cell of the body. So these cells can be used for a huge range of disease research. We're interested in turning them into brain cells, and we can turn them into any type of brain cell that's particularly important for that, for that disease. Okay? And then once we have those cells, we can compare healthy cells with cells from patients and try to find what's wrong. Is there a problem with cell communication? which pathways are disrupted, which proteins may be abnormal, to find new targets for drugs and for new treatments, to try to actually halt the disease early on and not be treating symptoms later on, as Emma had already talked about. And we can also use these as huge drug screening platforms and testing drugs for toxicity as well in a human-specific, you know, relevant system. I will leave it there. My contact details are there in case anybody wants to send me a question later on. Um, thank you for listening. Okay, so the question is, how do we turn those pluripotent stem cells into specific kinds of cells, for example, brain cells rather than liver cells or hair cells? Um, so what we're able to do in an in vitro system is we can manipulate the environment of those cells. So normally, developmentally in the body, Stem cells receive different signals at different times that lead them along an uh, ever-restricting pathway. So they start out, they can make anything, and then they become, for example, neural stem cells, they can only make brain cells, and then they become even more restricted, they can only make nerve cells, so they become more and more restricted. 
And by understanding what happens normally in development and the signals they receive, so if you remember back to the very beginning, I said my core interest from my background is in how the brain develops normally. We take what we know about what happens normally in the body to turn those cells into nerve cells, for example, and we recapitulate it in the dish. So if I know signal A turns them into neural stem cells, we can give them signal A in the, in the medium, in the food that they grow in, in the lab, and they respond to that and they start to, to become restricted into the right type of cell. So we can manipulate their environment using proteins and other signaling molecules that they would naturally see during the developmental process. We can also do it via less um, relevant, less physiological means. And there are many ways we can even genetically manipulate cells to push them into becoming a brain cell or a heart cell or a skin cell. So we have lots of different ways, but actually, this is where my own background in understanding how normal brain development happens can be applied to stem cell biology use for things like dementia research. We can make the right cells by understanding what happens normally. <coughs> Second question, one at the front. Yep, you. When you were first asked, I'm fascinating and really valuable. Um, I know this is impossible question really, but what is your time frame? Wow. So what's my time frame? That is an impossible question. Depends on time frame for what. <laughs> if we're talking about in getting this into a drug on the market, well, th there's no an simple answer, but we know that getting a drug from basic research through all the preclinical testing and through clinical trial can take 10 years, 20 years or more. Um, one thing that's kind of important is, so we were talking about, you know, what's the point of, of, of diagnosing dementia earlier? Another benefit that we might have of diagnosing dementia earlier is we may be able, some of the existing drugs that perhaps have failed in dementia patients, potentially, if you catch the disease earlier, they might work. Now, they've already been through a lot of the safety testing, etc., and they can be repurposed for, for use in perhaps earlier diagnosed dementia. And that would be a quicker, um, if you like, a, a quicker process. Um, whether it's going to happen or not uh, remains to be seen. But yes, it's certainly from, from this kind of basic research into the clinic, unless it's all, if it's a new drug, would take a long time. But if actually you find a, an existing drug that may even be for some other disease, works, once you identify what's the mechanism, oh, we could test this drug, then, potentially that would go through the, um, the clinical testing quicker because it's already approved for use in other, other disorders. So there's no answer, but there is an answer if you like. <laughs>